Welcome to the League of American Orchestras online conference, Global Stages, Local Stories. My name is James Barry, Manager of Artistic and Learning Programs. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items to attend to. First, the Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion track at this year's online conference, including this session, is made possible by a generous grant from the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. Second, the League is in the middle of our Stronger Together, Lee Giving Days campaign. If you have found value from participation in our free online conference or found the advocacy work coming from our DC office helpful, please consider making a gift. Just click the Stronger Together button in the navigation panel on the left side of your screen or visit our website. Thank you. During our session today, we'll be taking audience questions. To participate, please use the chat function at FeeLoop or in Zoom and we'll do our best to answer as many as possible. A recording of today's conversation will be made available in feed loop under session schedule tomorrow. Please keep an eye out for that. A tip for those of you in feed loop, please do not navigate away from the broadcast in your browser window as you'll be kicked off the session if you do. If that happens, don't worry, just rejoin the meeting and you'll pick right back up with us. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome a couple members of the press who are with us in the audience. We appreciate you attending. Lastly, we'd love to hear about your experience today. In the session description below, you'll find the link to a brief survey where you can share scores and comments. This feedback is invaluable to the League in informing and shaping future conference content. I do hope you will take a minute to complete it. Again, welcome to the League's online conference and welcome to today's session, Outside the Box, an Unconventional Orchestra Musician's Perspective. Joining us are three conservatory trained musicians who have carved out highly successful musical careers, violist Tia Allen and violinist Lady Jess and Stephanie Matthews. Let me take a couple minutes to give you a small taste of the space in which they work. Jess, Stephanie, and Tia regularly perform in orchestras, some which they founded, the Harlem Chamber Players, the Recollective Orchestra, the Soulful Symphony, and the Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra. They have played in the bands of today's leading popular artists, Beyonce, Lady Gaga, Eminem, Kanye West, Jay-Z, Stevie Wonder, Tony Bennett, The Eagles, John Legend, and Alicia Keys, just to mention a few. Their music making can be heard on countless TV and movie soundtracks, including The Lion King, Charlie's Angels, Frozen 2, Milan, and The Joker. They've appeared on The Tonight Show with The Roots, Saturday Night Live, Jimmy Kimmel Live, the Late Show with Stephen Colbert, Good Morning America, to The Today Show, the Grammy Awards, and the American Music Center, excuse me, the American Music Awards, and the Pit on Broadway, Jagged Little Pill, My Fair Lady, An American in Paris, On the Town, and they have founded thriving organizations such as Diverse Concert Artist and String Candy. I encourage you to take a few minutes to read through their individual bios and take in the full breadth of their accomplishments. Now over to Alex Lang, principal clarinetist of the Phoenix Symphony, who many of you will remember for his remarkable and thought-provoking keynote speech at our conference in Nashville last June, who will serve as the moderator for today's conversation. Over to you, Alex. Thanks, James. Um, so first off, welcome to everyone out there in the world. Welcome to my wonderful panelists. I'm so excited to get to talk to you. It's been really fun preparing for this session and uh, doing all those sort of pre-session conversations. Uh, this session is on the Committing to Equity, Diversity, and Inclusion track, which asserts a commitment to advancing the values and actions of equity, diversity, and inclusion, EDI, that are critical to the future work of American orchestras. Um, the particular frame that we're taking for this session, though, is that league orchestras are poorer and worse off right now, not in the future, right now, for not having these incredible musicians, Jessica, Stephanie, Tia, in their ranks. So we'll take this time to understand better 
how and why they love orchestras, why they are choosing not to pursue full-time employment in league orchestras, how their quote, unconventional career paths and application of orchestral training has unfolded, and what their practices have to teach league orchestras. So you've heard a little bit of an introduction of who they are, but I thought it'd be great to hear from them personally. So um, if we could all just take a few seconds to say a little bit about yourself, describe your practice. Uh, maybe I'll go in clockwise order the way I'm looking at you. So that would be Stephanie up first, just to tell us a little bit more about yourself, uh, how you define your practice, what your work is about, et cetera. Hey, um, thanks, <laughs> Alex. Uh, really glad to be here. Uh, my name is Stephanie Matthews. I'm a violinist and I am the founder and creative director of String Candy. And I am also the co-founder of the Recollective Orchestra, which is an all black orchestra um, whose mission is to raise the visibility and profile of black classical musicians. Um, I am based in Los Angeles, California, and I would say the majority of the work that I do is um, within the TV film industry. So I do a lot of scoring on the day to day. And um, I also do um, a lot of collaborating with music directors and artists, labels directly um, to contract musicians. So I hire musicians and other musical talent. So I've also hired um, singers, drummers, uh, band instruments as well uh, for tour placements and for live shows such as um, like the Grammy Awards, BET, all the award shows, <laughs> um, and for recording and live performances. Fantastic. Uh, Tia, you're sort of next in the, in the queue here. Hi, so I am Tia Allen. I am a violist and I am currently the violist for Jagged Little Pill on Broadway. Um, and in addition to that, I am the founder of Diverse Concert Artists. Um, and the mission of Diverse Concert Artists, it was founded to increase diversity within classical and crossover music. Um, in addition, I'm also a music educator and a contractor. Um, as, a, as an educator, I teach for Holland School of the Arts. Um, and as a contractor, I have contracted with some of the largest companies and, uh, and so from Twitter to Google for private functions and affairs um, to performances at the Kennedy Center and also including BAM. So that's just a little taste of what I do. Fantastic. Lady Jess. Hi. Um, so I work in New York and in Los Angeles. Um, primarily based in New York though. I'm a violinist. Um, my may, I guess, favorite <laughs> job would be performing with Beyonce. We just finished the On the Run 2 tour. So that was amazing. Um, and I also am co-artistic director of the Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra in New York with Tom Cunningham, who I believe is on the call as well. Hello, Tom. Um, and <laughs> When I'm in uh, Los Angeles, I'm either working with her or another mainstream artist, or I'm working in the film industry, um, partly due to Stephanie, actually. Um, I was on the Lion King soundtrack as part of the Recollective Orchestra. And Steph um, put me on my first TV gig with Saturday Night Live years ago. Um, but I also contract as well. I contracted, uh, I guess the biggest was for Solange for the Seat at the Table tour um, in Los Angeles, New York, and Berkeley um, at the Greek. So yeah, it's pretty, it's a pretty varied career, but most of the classical work I do has been in New York. I also taught for a long time with the Harmony program alongside Tia, and I'm playing, uh, I sit, sorry, I'm sorry about the popping. I think it's my earring. <laughs> I sit on the Harmony Program Junior Board. I don't know if Ann Fitzgibbon is in the audience today, but I will to her as well. So I don't currently teach regularly, um, but most of my work in performance is with a drive toward 
the immediate diversification of the stage and active representation at all levels. So, yeah. Fantastic. So we've had a number of really interesting and fascinating conversations leading up to this uh, public session. Um, so I'm just going to quickly recap uh, sort of what we talked about and then maybe uh, sort of unfold some of that for our audience. So um, we talked about uh, opportunity, right, and how you have sought opportunity, how you have created opportunity, how opportunity uh, has been denied. Um, we talked about networks and how some were closed to you and how you have built your own and what you believe about the power of networks. Um, we talked about success and how the training that we all went through as conservatory graduates gave, gave us um, a, a definition of success that uh, you three especially uh, found um, unfulfilling, maybe unachievable, unsatisfying. And so you've d developed your own definitions of success and have some interesting things to say about that. Uh, and the last thing we talked about was uh, resiliency and creativity and learning by doing and how that has related to your navigating your work and how you're working now, especially during the COVID-19 pandemic and how you feel your path in some ways uh, really prepared you for this moment and has some powerful lessons, I think, to teach uh, orchestras and other musicians. So looking at those sort of four conversation areas we touched on, uh, opportunity, networks, success, resiliency, um, can we use that now to sort of frame and unfold the conversation that we've been having for a couple of weeks here for our audience? So taking this first one, opportunity, um, Tia, you had some wonderful things to say about that, what it means to you and the importance of opportunity. And uh, yeah, the floor is yours. And then afterwards, um, Stephanie and uh, Lady Jess uh, will join in with um, thoughts they have in response to Tia or thoughts they have, uh, you know, on their own. So Tia, yeah, tell us about opportunity from your perspective. Yeah, I mean, when I think about opportunity, I think about that as one of the driving forces that have led me through the path in my career. And when I think about moving forward in terms of how to cultivate our opportunity, how to seek opportunity, how to create and give opportunity to other people now in my career. So leading me down this path, you know, I was, I am conservatory trained. You know, I have four college degrees in music and my whole entire path while I was in a conservatory from Cincinnati to Manhattan School of Music, I always was taught in this mindset that you practice hard, you stay in the practice room for, you know, it's four to eight hours a day sometimes just so you can clock in those hours. And then you're just going to magically go apply for that job that everybody else has applied for, 200 people. You'll take the audition and you'll win one of them. And that will make you happy. <laughs> and as I was going through my last degree, um, when I was at Manhattan School of Music, one of our projects was to actually seek out people um, in the field. And I wanted to very much kind of analyze what was it like to have a career that was in one of these spaces that I was taught was an institution I was supposed to be part of. So I had a conversation with uh, my friend who was in the Met Opera uh, in the pit, in the orchestra pit, and also a friend of mine who has a thriving career as a freelancer in the city. And looking at both of those careers, and I was just going, well, one is a very straight track, and one can lead me down one path. And what systems is in place for me in that path? And what ways can I create opportunities for myself in that path, besides just sitting in a practice room and taking an audition and, and praying and hoping to God that I will win and that is a space for me? And I looked down this other path that had so many, um, so many places for opportunity for me in that space and in that career as a freelancer. And that's kind of where my career started to take off. And I decided to go down this freelance path in terms of I wanted to be able to be in a space where I could create opportunity to where I could create. Um, I didn't want to have to be sitting around waiting for somebody to call me. 
you know, whether or not that's calling me to tell me that I advanced to the next level, whether that's calling me to tell me that um, I won the won this job, you know, I was I wanted to be able to be in a space where I could create and give that for myself and for other people. And mm. that's what actually led me to find diverse concert artists. Mm. And it was doing something that was so fulfilling because not only was I able to now be in a space where I was creating opportunity for myself by finding this group, I was able to give back and create opportunity for other people. And mm -hmm. I can't stress how the importance of that because it's really people think about, well, what can I do to change the, this field and change what it looks like and change the face of what it looks like to to go to an orchestra concert and who I see on stage what can I mm. do you can create opportunity you can mm. every single person has that option and choice to do that whether or not it's in their career whether that's you're sitting on a board of an orchestra whether mm. or not you are the personnel manager you have that opportunity to then create opportunity for other people and it's mm. it's your choice what you do in and with that space. Mm. So you know, um, that's one of the things I thought was so interesting and compelling about what you said, and you just did it now, and you, you speak so passionately and you equate it so closely to your sort of artistic identity, this idea of creating opportunity, that you really see that as you know, part of your work in the same way as uh, making a beautiful sound or whatever. Um, Stephanie, Lady Jess, do you have any sort of thoughts? Does that spark anything in you or anything in response or to continue what, what Tia was talking about? Um, well, I, I agree. I, I totally <laughs> co-sign. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing to debate here. <laughs> okay. Great. Great. Awesome. Um, well, then let's go to this. We'll, and we'll, we'll probably circle back to all of this, but, but looking at this conversation uh, no we had around networks um, and networks that you found, networks that you created, networks that you tried to get into and felt um, denied, networks you didn't even know existed until later. Uh, Stephanie, yeah. you've, you've had a lot to say about that. Um, can we <laughs> sort of kick off that talk about yeah. networks and, and how they impact orchestral life and how they've impacted your practice now? Sure. Um, I strongly believe that network, our network influences everything around us. Um, our trajectory, career path, um, even like personal network versus professional network, it's all networking. Um, so it's not just as it pertains to the orchestra field, but as we're speaking about this um, specifically, um, I found it really interesting after having various conversations with um, my colleagues and people that I had gone to school with and met at competitions, you know, it's kind of like your pack, right? You know, um, a lot of times I would tell students like, make sure that you're getting the most out of um, your educational experience, especially when you're in school, because these are people that you are going to bump into for the rest of your career in some capacity. And so now I find myself being friends with people who are on boards at the Kennedy Center um, or starting their own orchestras, other contractors, music directors, composers, conductors, um, musicians in the, these top orchestras, Alex, principal <laughs> clarinetist of Phoenix Symphony, you know. And so um, network is important. Now in that, um, I found it interesting that I had very different experiences from some of my other colleagues. And this isn't just like a racial bias inequity kind of thing. So I wanna start there because I think that um, your teacher and the people that are your mentors kind of in this kind of growth process and learning experience like while you're in school really influence how prepared you're going to be entering the field and what options will be available to you. And so, um, like I have a very, very good friend of mine, Jennifer Arnold, who now works with the Richmond Symphony. Um, she was in the Oregon Symphony for many years as a violist. And, um, you know, we were talking about this one day and she was saying that, you know, her 
private teacher when she was at Cleveland, you know, helped prepare her for orchestra auditions and she landed this job. Now, I, I can actually say that being in an orchestra never really entered my realm of, <laughs> you know, what, what was mm -hmm. even probable at that point, because I, I really honestly can't say that I recall having any real serious conversation with any of my private teachers about preparing for orchestra auditions. And so mm -hmm. I think that has a lot to do with it, right? So my, my private teachers were not members of any orchestra. One was, you know, in a chamber group for many years. Um, I think both of them actually were um, uh, chamber musicians. And one of, one of my instructors was a professional soloist for many years. So mm -hmm. I think that has something to do with it. Um, I didn't learn about musical chairs until I was in my 30s. You know, mm -hmm. I mean, so these are resources that you need to really know about to even really be competitive to get the access point, you know? Um, so I do think that network has a lot to do with it. Um, and then I think what can be a real challenge is that when we, when we have these opportunities in school, um, I used to, you know, work part-time <laughs> at the Juilliard school for work study. And, you know, I had friends that literally were winning auditions. Like one girl won, you know, her orchestra audition for the Detroit Symphony and left school so that she could work, you know? And it, I just remember thinking like, wow, I didn't, where's, I didn't even know about an audition, you know? And so I think some of the difficulty is when you entrust the information to people who are then being selective about how they disseminate the information can be a challenge mm -hmm. because you're gonna mm -hmm. leave people out. And that's mm -hmm. what I mean by network. Some people have the information and the access um, partially because there are people who are invested in seeing them get to those positions. Um, and mm -hmm. other people are left on the outside. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it, it, um, it one, all kind of ties in. One just a jargon check for our audience. Can you just define quickly what Musical Chairs is for anyone in the audience? Sorry, know? yes. Musical Chairs is an online resource that lists all of the available um, positions within orchestras. So, I mean, and that's internationally, not just American right. orchestras. And just to be clear, Stephanie, you, you know, you went to Indiana University, the Juilliard School, like very high powered string schools. And you're noting the, um, yeah, how, how shocking it is in some ways that that wasn't even put on your radar. Um, yeah. Fantastic. Does that, uh, Lady Jess, Tia, does, did, did anything Stephanie say sort of spark anything that you want to add to our conversation right now or share with the audience? Oh, she, I co-signed everything. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's exactly right. It's exactly yeah. right. I, co sure. I co-signed and I want to say to add to that in terms yeah. of when we talk about looking into find spaces to network or looking to find spaces where I felt like I could be a part of that, but I would go to musical chairs because that, that was mm. what I would do when mm -hmm. I was still yeah. in school and I was looking out Same. for auditions. I would go to those orchestras. Like, let's say it was an orchestra in Paris or it was an orchestra mm -hmm. in China. I would mm -hmm. go on those, I would go online and I would look at all of the names of people Hours. that are in the orchestra. There wouldn't be one, and it's not, I'm not even saying a name that looks African American or that looks Indian or that looks, I, there was no name that wasn't of their national mm. origin. Mm. So yeah. It, yeah. it didn't feel like a space that would have been safe for me to take yeah. an international mm. audition because it's like, what am I auditioning for? I'm not going mm. to be, except this isn't my space. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's one thing to say yeah. on an international level. So the same thing happens on our own soil here. Mm. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's actually perfect because when we were in school, it was kind of like, um, I know I didn't really hear about musical chairs until my senior, junior year, so 22, 23. And um, that was like the source for everything. That was the center of everything. Like you, mm. unless you had a connect through a certain way that the, the institution is set up, 
then you go to musical chairs. That's where you even found out about auditions. But that was also where I remember commiserating with my friends who many of whom were not uh, women of color because that's who I was in school with. And they were all like, because all of us wanted to join orchestras outside of the United States. I really wasn't looking at orchestras at home because my assumption was, I don't have that pedigree. Let me just skip that. And I want to travel anyway, because I hadn't mm -hmm. been out of the country at that point. Mm -hmm. So we were all looking at different, different orchestras overseas. And inevitably they became like my filter. Cause I was like, I'm going to let them apply and mm. see what happens. And there was always a block at nationality because mm. it was very, it was a very homogenous space mm -hmm. um, back then. Mm -hmm. And because I have not been in a place to apply for any orchestra jobs in a while, like I'm not current on what it's like now, but mm -hmm. back then it was definitely like everything they said, like that's actually it. And so the real crazy thing is to be here at home, having to experience those same emotional and and artistic struggles and all of that that we can't really define in the define in the moment without looking insane to deal with that mm -hmm. at home is is true it's it's really crazy and it makes you question your previous 20 years of study on mm -hmm. on the thing mm -hmm. so i agree absolutely um this is so fascinating let's turn uh to this question of success right uh which you are all three uh, enjoying in great measure. Congratulations. <laughs> um, and uh, let's, let's talk about um, how our training defines success, uh, how that did or did not create friction um, within you, how you define set success now, how you find coin, how you find money now, and how that all um, has unfolded for you. And, and Lady Jess, if we could start with you, and I love starting with you on this one because um, you know, you're someone who tells a story uh, that, you know, has orchestras really front and center in your origin story, like where your love for yeah. music and making music yeah. for other people started. And um, so, yeah, if you could talk about sort of how you, how you were taught to define success, how you now define success, and just a little bit about how that all unfolded for you. And also maybe share a little bit about how you first fell in love with orchestras. Oh, yeah. Um... I was in the junior Charlotte Symphony Junior Youth Orchestra and I was coming out of like a string orchestra program through a, a group of Charlotte Mecklenburg school system teachers who just were like kids should have an opportunity outside of just the youth orchestra in order to play like orchestral music outside of school. Um, which is a huge testament to the public music school system in Charlotte. I think we kind of had like an unusual caliber of invested teachers for us. They started, they started a string orchestra called the Sizzling Strings and then that expanded to the Blazing Band. And so because of that, I had, that was like my first ensemble experience. And I was like carnivorous with the thing. I was like, I don't know what this is, but I'm here. And then the natural progression was to then audition for the youth orchestra. And I did that not knowing that it was a full symphony orchestra. Mm. So at the first rehearsal, I thought I was walking into a more advanced sizzling string situation. And it was like completely symphonic. And so, because I was at the back of the second violin section, I was like right next to the winds. And I was, I was, like the minute, I think it was, it was Nutcracker. It was a Nutcracker overture was the first thing we rehearsed. And it was, it was awful. I mean, we were young, like we were like, <laughs> it was like sixth grade. Like, but and I was just like shell shocked at the appearance of all these other instruments. It was like a wall of sound. So that was such a stamp for me that the orchestral track, once I actually learn to love listening to classical music and understanding that classical music was interlaced into so many things that I enjoyed. That was like the, the jump off point. Um, and so the motivation was always orchestral. And when I went to North Carolina School of the Arts, University of North Carolina School of the Arts now, um, my private teacher was extremely invested in me and 
my first ally in many ways, but he was not into the idea of orchestra as a career. And he wasn't into that idea for me. And his way of being an ally for me had so much to do with my personal life. And I needed that at that time. Um, and he did it in such a clean cut, like no nonsense kind of way that I maintained a really stubborn hold onto the idea of orchestra as a profession, not knowing that he could see beyond me to what I was actually capable of. And um, his name is Kevin Lawrence, by the way. Shout out to Kevin Lawrence. Kale. <laughs> I owe him a lot. Um, and I was very stubborn. And so I clung to the orchestra track. And um, after school, I started playing with, I took two years off between grad school and undergrad. And I started playing with the Charlotte Symphony as a regular extra. But at that time, I was also interning um, under the mentorship of Jonathan Martin, who was the then executive director. He's in Dallas now. I don't know if he's on the call. If he is, hi. Um, <laughs> and so I was maintaining an administrative internship that I was not being paid for and I was not receiving college credit for, but I was also playing in the orchestra at the same time. And I was subbing out for Broadway shows that came through Charlotte that used local players. So I was making the connections with New York people at the same time, just by promising myself I'd play every note. I, I know that sounds ridiculous, but I, I had no track for this stuff. And I was like, the only way I know to do this well is to just show up at 200%. I got that from my dad, who's a jazz musician. Um, and so I made those connections there and tried to learn the administrative business from Jonathan. And he was an incredible teacher, but he wanted me to, because he knew that part of my, my concerns were fiscal as well. I wanted job security. I wanted benefits. Um, I had never felt a sense of uh, that kind of security before. Um, we were not exposed to insurance so much growing up. So all I knew, and I was on my own, so all I knew is that I needed to do something that integrated music in a way that would make me feel secure. So that was the reason for pursuing the administrative track. And so the mm -hmm. skills that I used there, I use in contracting now. Um, and that's how those things helped me. But I was never able to really like break in. At the mm. time that I was an administrative intern, I applied to upwards of 200 different jobs and got preliminary interviews to two of them. And mm. so playing and moving to New York through performance ended up how I got into NYU and then NYU was how I got to New York. And so mm. it's always been just, I guess when you're in it, you don't think about it in terms of success because so much mm -hmm. of the drive is being success successful despite not being able to break in to this standard that I don't mm -hmm. know about because I haven't had the same pedigree as mm -hmm. other people. But mm -hmm. at the same time, yeah. because I've approached things um, from a money perspective, I've been a Spoleto fellow um, a few summers and I only, only even applied because it was the only summer festival I saw that paid. It was a fellowship. Mm. And that Tia and I spent a few summers at Spoleto together actually. Um, <laughs> And so in that way, I was exposed to these upper levels of playing and I'm right there with them. They all assume that I've taken the, the traditional track I have not. Um, and so that paradox has followed me like throughout mm. um, the process. So it's interesting mm. that the question is posed around success because when you're in it, it feels like you're just proving people wrong. And that was legit mm. my motivation if I'm being very honest for years you know what I mean mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um yeah Stephanie Tia anything to to add or um continue or build on in there um sure yeah I mean I I think 
all of us have experienced some level of that. Um, but in particular, I, I wanted to kind of talk about these, these opportunities that seemingly um, are closed door to a lot of us. Um, I think the whole pedigree thing is truly um, a bit of an obstacle. Um, I think a lot of people really like to get hung up on the brand name of the school um, mm -hmm. and not necessarily um, the holistic value of a person, an artist, a musician, a talent, um, an asset. And I think what's really interesting is, you know, any of us who have taught at any level or degree, especially young people who are playing at a level where they can really viably consider going into music professionally, we're like, go for the teacher. <laughs> don't, go, don't choose the school because of the name, go for the teacher. And then yes. when they get out of here, you know, they're like, oh, but what school did you go to? So, mm. you know, there's this conflicting information. Um, mm. And I think we really have to be honest about that because mm. I think that organizations get tripped up on it. And then there is an, a vast pool of talent that's on the outskirts, you know, mm. of, of your sphere of influence, you know, mm. that are just not being reached and not being mm. um, tapped into at all. Mm. 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 Tia, did you have anything to say? And only if you do, of course. Um, just to kind of piggyback off of that is I, I remember when I was still in school and people would apply to Juilliard to study with my teacher in his viola studio, which he only would only accept about two to three violists at Juilliard, but he had a studio of 30 to 40 plus <laughs> violas at Cincinnati. And it would blow my mind. I'd go, well, why didn't you apply to Cincinnati? That's where his big viola studio is. His big violin studio is in Juilliard. So why didn't you mm. apply to Cincinnati? <laughs> but people wanted that name. And, and mm. for me, it was, again, I would always do my research. It wasn't, you know, it was the teacher, but then it was also what city am I living in? Because I, mm -hmm. I had messed up in, in terms of their, my first year I ever went out and went to college. I was one of maybe 10 people on the campus of Miami University in Oxford, Ohio. So I, you know, uh, there, was, there was more of a driving force, obviously, to get into a program that was just better suited for me and my career. But mm -hmm. that, was a, that was definitely a part of it, that I just, I mm -hmm. did not feel like I was in a space where I felt comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, so moving to Cincinnati, which was just more of a diverse space in, in general, and then obviously moving to New York, um, mm -hmm. just was being in a space where I felt comfortable in my in my mm -hmm. space to to create mm -hmm. and then to seek out opportunity. Um, and then just in terms of redefining what success means. I mean, yeah, it was literally me having to turn off what I was prescribed that like orchestra job, orchestra job, get this orchestra job. That is success. I had to then redefine. I remember when I had done college essays and things about what my career looked like at the, when I got out of school. And I'd always said, well, I'm playing chamber music. I'm giving back in terms of education. I am playing in orchestras. And I was actually doing all of those things. So then I was like, what was the problem? Just because it didn't have a bow that said New York Phil on it. And just because it didn't have a bow mm -hmm. that said St. Louis Symphony on it, I was actually mm -hmm. playing in orchestras. I was playing in chamber orchestras. I was traveling. I was playing in chamber ensembles. I was, I was doing all those things. I was giving back in terms of education. So then what was it then that wasn't making me happy? And then that's when, you know, going back to our first topic, it was when I could finally create opportunities for myself in this space and feel mm -hmm. like I was in a safe space. And the, mm. I just, it, the redefining of what success meant was, it just was a different thing. It wasn't it's just- a, It's a reclaiming of control. Yeah. It's a reclaiming of control over your own narrative because mm. you, 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 you give emotionally, physically, spiritually to this thing. You spend so many hours alone, so many hours working towards this metric and this metric, trying to win this spot and win this spot. And it's like, and you then, invest all of that. Where is the yeah. coin? You know, it's just like, you know, it, it, it's, 
you need a return on that. And then we just didn't find it. I never found the return on that investment that wasn't moment on stage, you know, that mm. were like spiritual. Here's mm. one last thing I want to add, because I could not agree more. I mean, the investment is huge. I mean, huge. when you think about, you know, the countless number of private lessons <laughs> that you have mm -hmm. to take to get yourself to a point yeah. where you are competitive enough to even viably consider getting into a music school or conservatory program, okay? The mm. summer festivals, the instrument, instrument maintenance. Oh my God. Um, you know, I, I'm just saying like, there are costs mm. to these things. All of these things are not free. And mm -hmm. realistically speaking, you know, once you come out on the other side, I mean, your hope is that you can sustain yourself and not be living in debt and saddled in debt for the rest of your natural life. And when you think about these auditions, kind of similar to what Tia was talking about, you know, when, at least for me, um, you know, I had toyed with the idea of auditioning for orchestras at a time. Um, I had, when, when I was in high school, I was in the NSO Youth Fellowship Program. Whoa, whoa, and so whoa, whoa. I had, I know, hey, <laughs> um, and I was also, DMV. you know, you know, DC Metro Virginia, uh, DC Maryland, mm -hmm. Virginia area. And I was in the DC Youth Orchestra Program. Shout out to mm -hmm. Lynn McLean for having the mm -hmm. vision um, for allowing kids like me, you know, to have access mm. to the orchestra mm. experience. Mm. And, um, mm. So, I mean, I, I had considered it. I didn't have any real information about how it was going to happen. But I was like, man, this thing is cool. That was my first time getting bit by the travel bug. I traveled for the first time with the youth orchestra, you know. And, um, but, you know, when you start really considering the cost, again, we're coming back to investment. It takes money, <laughs> you know. And, I mean, I'm still paying back Sally Mae, who has now um, handed me over to Navient. Shout out to them. Um, but the reality is, you know, it, you have to pay for flight to get to these auditions wherever, and they're not all in the same city. You know what I mean? So you're flying here, there, and everywhere. If you're a cellist or a bassist, my God, you know, I mean, cartage fees, and then you got to put yourself up. Hopefully you have family or friends, but if not, you got to put yourself up and hope to goodness that you make it through these rounds. And then, you know, just to say, well, you know, maybe next time. And then you start all over. I mean, it costs money. And so God bless the people that have the resources financially to do that. But for me, I, my parents didn't, don't have that kind of money. I certainly don't have that kind of money. So I had to really realistically look at what my options were. And that didn't seem to be a realistic viable option because I mean, at the end of the day, you know, I want to make a living like anyone else. You know, I love this. I love music. I mean, I've invested my entire life doing what I do, essentially. You know, I started playing like when I was like three, started taking what like formal private lessons at four. So it's not like I just like decided on a whim, maybe I'll try this thing out. You know, I had to really look at um, what what could like this kind of redefin redefining success. Um, and I definitely had um, some teachers and some colleagues who were like, oh, well, you know, you don't, either you're not a professionally managed soloist or a professionally managed chamber group. If you don't win a spot in the orchestra, then you just didn't cut it. And the buck stopped there. Um, so I had to really kind of, uh, hit a mental reset. Mm. Fascinating. Um, and so I'd like to do two things. One, I just want to exercise a little personal privilege and make the point to our audience out there listening that, you know, I think it goes unremarked upon the degree to which musicians who more often than not do not currently hold full-time positions inside the mainstream orchestral structure fund and subsidize the job search for every orchestral position in a league orchestra in America. And contrast that with how those institutions approach a director of development, a CEO, so these. And so I just wanna make that, and I'm not saying like that's an inequity and we need to change that. I actually just want some acknowledgement that like the musician field of 
underemployed musicians are the ones who subsidize this smorgasbord of options that appears at every job opening when they write section clarinet, section violin, XYZ orchestra, right? And so sometimes it's, I think, hundreds of thousands of dollars actually, especially if you are valuing people's time. So forgetting about the airline cost, right? Tickets for yourself, if you're a cello or bass, you've got another one right there or, or significant cartage. And then the hotel, the food in that city, right? But then also the person hours of those 80 people, hundreds of hours of practicing, is that worthless? Of course not. So the total value that goes into any one audition is really um, quite significant and one that's borne by the field of underemployed musicians, right? Those are the ones going, anyway, leaving that aside. Can I right? add something so, really sure, fast? Yeah. Um, we are all investing in an industry where the contributions of the people that came before us do not have equity, be it in educational standards, in audition rep, sometimes for organizations that exist for us, we don't have representation in the rep. So I should say that when you are fighting to be recognized as someone who is equal, when you come from a different socioeconomic background than the people around you, who are not racist, but just literally live a different life experience. If you're already feeling left out and then asked to devote so much of yourself to a canon of music that doesn't include contributions from people that look like you and have shared, more importantly, have shared your experience within the classical corner of this field, mm. then it's twice the labor. It's mm. twice the emotional labor. It's twice mm. the resilience necessary. And it's twice the self-assuredness to keep reminding yourself that it's okay, that you mm. that it's okay that you're at the audition. It's okay that you're the only one who looks like this literally on stage right. or in the booth. Like all of that is so much mental work. And people talk about things like emotional labor within the terms of romantic relationships, but that crosses those boundaries to me mm. that exists in something like music because at the end of the day mm -hmm. we're artists so all of that mm -hmm. soul in there all of that commitment all that passion is compounded by the struggle to even just feel like why why like i don't know mm. they're never i don't know i don't know mm. if i belong here i guess mm. like i love it so i guess like i'm gonna try and convince me but i'm just saying and if you are not coming from a place where you are surrounded by support, or if you're come if you're not coming from a place where it's like standard that you'll go to college and not work, you know, like you'll just go and you'll just do it, then that can be a really alienating situation, and that's mm -hmm. just more labor. Mm, I like that. I I really like that idea of emotional labor within a relationship as it relates yeah. to our relationship to the art form. Um, so I'd like to pivot. <laughs> yeah, right? No, no, I, I totally <clears throat> I'd like to pivot a little bit and talk about um, the current moment that we're in and also return in our mind to the original framing that, I, that we put around this session, right? That this is not about making some better future for orchestras, but it's talking about poor, how orchestras are poorer right now. I would, you know, I, I, I um, are poorer right now for not having musicians like you in their midst for having missed the boat on you three specifically. Um, and I'd love to talk about how you think your path has prepared you for this moment, um, how you're uh, navigating this moment, and what, if anything, you think that has to teach our audience uh, from the League of American Orchestras. Um, and uh, I'll, Tia, is it okay to start with you? Sure. Um, just in terms of this moment i mean I, I remember even when i was got that call and i was told that i was in jagged little pill and i had this job for broadway which i think most people in their minds go boom i got a full-time job i am good i've said i got benefits like let's go um but for me that wasn't the case i for me it's um i think those people that have been in the broadway scene for a while those people that have subbed those people that have freelanced no know, knows what it's like one when a show opens and closes a month later that a show can close within six years and then you're stuck with what do i do now i think it's the same mindset of somebody that's gone on a tour 
with an artist and you're on that tour and you're making coin and you get back and you're like, okay, where's my network now? Let me see what I can do now. What's next? Like, let's keep this going. But I think at the same time, I'd never lost hold of what all of my other goals and opportunities were. And um, same thing, you know, I never said, well, I have Jagged Little Pill now, so I'm done with diverse concert artists. This was now I have even a bigger of a platform now, you know, this is something you can say, like, not only is the founder of Diverse Concert Artists, um, you know, has all this background, but now I also play full time on Broadway. I'm coming with of this other experience. Um, so for me, it was just now what else can I do to then broaden my other platforms and still create other opportunities? And I think that's what's happening now. It's been giving me this time. It's I'm trying to use this time right now that all those times I needed a breath, <laughs> all those times when I would wake up at 7 a.m. just so I could practice, so I could run to one rehearsal, so I could run to another rehearsal, so I could run to then do a night performance at night, so then to go get on a plane, to then come directly back. To, and then I go, I look at my calendar and go, I don't have a day off for the next three weeks, but I'm, I'm, I'm going. So mm. <laughs> I'm using this time now to then take that breath that I really needed and mm. let the air clear and then let's redefine how I can come back into the space even better, even stronger and, you know, still not with the mindset of a go-getter, but with the mindset of a go-giver. Mm. So that's what I'm mm. this time to do now. Go-givers and emotional labor. These are some great, these are some great one-liners. Um, Stephanie, yeah, I know you're actually uh, still doing a lot of work right now. Um, yeah, just speak to sort of how your path prepared you for this moment and maybe recognizing our audience, how you think that has something to offer orchestras, how maybe if you had, yeah, so I'll just, I'll just shut up and listen to you. <laughs> no, that's, yeah, it's, it's actually a really interesting shift to witness and to kind of live through this time uh, because I, I feel like everything that I've encountered um, on my career path and in my journey as an artist has prepared me for a moment like this. And that's simply being proactive instead of being reactive in regards to opportunity, creating my own opportunities and um, I never really felt like I had a moment where I could lean on any source of income with certainty and assurance. And so I was constantly, you know, it's kind of like chess. I mean, to be completely honest with you, because like I said, I, I don't have parents that, that can like provide that financial you know, blanket, you know, that can catch me if, if everything falls apart. I mean, they've certainly um, helped me get to this point. And like, you know, in terms of like funding private lessons, like as a, you know, as a kid, sure. But at this level, I, you know, I had to really think strategically. And I think that's where entrepreneurship comes into play. Because I find that the artists that are business minded and organizations that have strong entrepreneurship at the front are the ones that are going to weather this thing and emerge stronger and more resilient. Um, again, you know, starting, you know, the Recollective Orchestra with Matt Jones, who's fantastic. Um, so shout out to him. Sure. But, and also String Candy. Like, I started these entities out of necessity, not because I went to business school, not because I went to some illustrious and, and went through some illustrious, you know, arts admin program. And there are some fantastic ones out there, but that's not why I felt equipped because I can't say that I felt equipped. I felt like it was necessary. And I said, you know what, um, when I decided to start my company, I, and I'm sure, you know, Tia can share the same thing with starting Diverse Concert Artists was like, I mean, I'm 
frankly not <laughs> at a point where I can just wait around and hope that you think I'm great and hire me. You know, I have bills to pay and they are not going to wait until you decide that you want to bring me on board. And so I had to kind of search within my own immediate network. And I think that's important for any artist to consider. Look within your own immediate network and cultivate that because that's what enabled me to start my company and for me to, you know, book the kinds of gigs that I book to, you know, have a network of musicians and artists that I can reach out to that, you know, that I can hire, that I can refer for various opportunities. And I mean, creating opportunity is great. And in, th in the course of that, in the course of, you know, starting a business, again, with no business, formal business background, but just the sheer desire to one, work, two, create opportunity, and three, to not be tied down and burdened by anyone else's or any other entity's perception of what I should or should not be doing. And mm. that has, all of that, I think, has prepared me for something like this. I mean, we're, none of us are really fully prepared, but to be able to brace for it, I was never dependent on a salary. I was never dependent on um, one particular source. So it's always kind of thinking three, four or five steps ahead. And like Tia was mentioning, you know, broadening the platform. It, there was never a point where, you know, I was like, okay, well, this is it. I can finally go. I never felt like I had that moment. And mm -hmm. And so with that said, and I mean, I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being in a salaried position. I think it's great. You know, who doesn't want and need benefits, <laughs> you know, and, and to be able to know like how much you're going to make month to month, like no one wants to drive themselves crazy, like trying to figure it out all the time. But now I'm in an, op I'm in a situation where, because I was kind of working on my own terms people come to me. So a lot of what I'm doing is what I've been doing for many years now. I've been remote recording for years. It's so funny because um, one, of my, one of my friends is Tina Guo. Um, if some of, some of you may know or not know, she's a cellist. She's based in LA and Vegas now. But um, she's done so many remote recordings and she's been remote recording for years. And now the culmination of all these years of self-investment she's working on her own terms that girl is mm. scoring films every day from home you know mm. and so i think that this is a great opportunity speaking to the current audience um this is where i think entrepreneurship really needs to kick in because this is an unprecedented time with unprecedented opportunity to access mm. an entirely new audience to broaden your platform um, if you allow yourselves to do so. Mm. And I think that so uh, aptly sums up the frame for this, right? Because I know that on the other side of this call, there are people who run and work within orchestras at varying places and levels who are wishing that uh, they had access to you as a member of their ensemble, all three of you and your Rolodexes and your networks and the way you have crafted your practice and the way you can project out um, music right now. And good, I thought we had lost Lady Jess for a second. Um, so what I'd like to do now is um, actually, uh, we have a great question, which I think uh, tr nicely transitions to our, it's one of the activities that we did. So in preparation for this, I asked, uh, Lady Jess and Stephanie and Tia to engage in a little imaginary exercise, which was to craft a job description for a job in an orchestra that would actually attract them away from the career and lives that they've made right now. So to try to put it in a real context, we've talked about how orchestras are poor for not having these amazing musicians in them and for having sort of um, missed out on them. Um, and so I, I thought it'd be interesting to sort of uh, posit what would, what would bring you back. And before we get to that, um, and I also want to uh, sort of uh, forecast that we're going to end with another little exercise that I asked the panelists to engage in, which was to finish uh, the sentence, 
uh, I knew I was in the right place when. Um, so we'll, we'll get to those two things before we close. But I did want to take a, a really great question that we got from uh, the, the, the audience out here. And I'll, I'll just read it to you. Um, let's see. Ooh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm navigating my chat stream here to find it and uh, da, 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 da. yes, great. Yeah, okay. So the question is, how can a local orchestra be on the forefront to help tear down some of the racial equities and foster inclusion? I think they meant inequities and foster inclusion by encouraging all students to really pursue a career in music and music performance. How do we get around the issue of access? So um, also, if, if you're okay, I'll, maybe I'll just read a couple more questions from the audience and we can sort of see what, what comes through. So there was another question that said, uh, curious about the panelists' thoughts on what the musicians' union's responsibility is to the orchestra world at large, members and non, to help close this information gap. In my view, musical chairs has become the platform that the union isn't willing to be. And then someone, Tia, wants to know what's behind you on the wall. Uh, it's another, you've gotten a couple of compliments on your wall hanging. So just know that your interior decor skills are admired. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, let's take both of those sort of in turn. You know, what would a local orchestra need to do? Um, and what, what do you think our union uh, could do? And I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, all, all four of us are members of the American Federation of Musicians. So yeah, let's, let's uh, in either order, whichever one comes to mind, um, uh, let's start with uh, Tia, if you have anything to say on this. I love being first. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that's true, I'm sorry, you know, I threw it on I, you a couple of times. <laughs> I think going back to what's going to draw somebody in, like I said before, when I was looking to orchestras and orchestras that I was auditioning for, I wasn't just looking at, okay, I see um, a listing that says viola position. I, find, I got to a point where I said, okay, let me do more research. I want to research about the city that I would be possibly moving to. I want to research about what they are doing in terms of bringing in an audience, in terms of audience engagement. I want to do research about what they're doing for outreach in terms of education into the community. Who was on their roster in terms of what were the, the soloists that were brought in that year? Who was on their program in terms of the artists that, that they had that year? And then something as, as simple as, I mean, honestly, for me, a lot of times my biggest thing that I saw as a barrier a lot of times is I would go to a roster and these are rosters that are posted they're public platforms you can see who every single one of those musicians are and I go through this entire roster and if I don't see one person not one on that roster that it, it looks like me or that looks like it's in some way that you're trying to bring in a diverse art, uh, audience that wants to see themselves on stage that wants to hear diverse um, repertoire on stage that is inclusive, that is reflective of your audience and your community, then, you know, what, th this is an organization that's for me. Mm. So I, mm. I want to be able in a, in a space that I feel safe as well. Mm. So it, it's, you know, and, the, and I'm not talking about the safety net of having insurance. I'm talking a, a safe space to be my most authentic, creative, artistic self. Katia, this is like a good moment. I'm going to read it with your permission. Uh, your description of, um, before we even get into your viola position within the orchestra, this is the orchestra that you described that might uh, entice you back into the ranks of full-time orchestra life. Uh, the challenging the, so this is a description of this fictitious institution. Challenging, changing the face of the modern orchestra through diversity in the arts. Inclusion and diversity vertically integrated into all facets of our organization, including the performing arts, repertoire programs, educational outreach, and community, community audience engagement, right? That's a description of, Norksha would have to be that and back it up for you to uh, sort of look beyond those two words, section viola. Um, Steph and, and Lady Jess, do you have anything to say or add? Just to reframe, the, the, there was a question from the, from the world about, um, what can an orchestra do, right? What can a, and I think they've located it as a, a smaller orchestra. 
And, um, and what, if anything, do you think our union should be doing or could do? do you, Steph, you go. Are you going to eh? If you want to go first, it doesn't matter. <laughs> yeah, I'll, I'll just say it because I'll forget otherwise. But <laughs> um, I feel like regardless of the size of your orchestra, the current like atmosphere with the internet, with social media, it doesn't matter. If you take marketing seriously, if you take optics seriously, then it won't matter how big or small your orchestra is. Um, the other thing I was gonna say about that is that Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra is a small ensemble. It's relatively new, but the kind of programming that has been done has been more revolutionary than all of my orchestral experience, both in terms of educational programming. We did a partnership um, with Opportunity Music Project, which is another nonprofit in New York. And we gave children from underserved communities, I just hate the term, sorry, but you know what I mean, um, the opportunity to study chamber music very seriously over a very consistent amount of time and then perform that with their coaches at a high level. It wasn't just like babysitting hour. It was a very involved program and we got to know the chamber music groups and we formed a bomb with them. And so those kinds of things that are happening in an orchestra that's a chamber orchestra and new are things that are a, should be a piece of cake for any orchestra to ingratiate into their program. It doesn't matter how big or small you are. If you have a marketing department that is current and knows actually what's going on and you ha and is in touch with mainstream culture and you have a development department that works in harmony with that marketing department and that understands how to talk to new people who can provide fiscal support but that also can relate to people in the community around where the orchestra mm. is housed. That's mm. what I would say, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree with that. I mean, we were kind of talking about, you know, the the um, orchestra structure as a fiduciary experience in a previous conversation. So we're aware, this is a business, okay? So um, organizations are making their decisions based on dollars <laughs> and cents. Um, so keeping that in mind, what, what Jess is saying is, is spot on. I mean, you definitely want to have a marketing team that knows how to talk to different types of people. If you don't know how to talk to different types of people, then you're probably not gonna get a varied audience, okay? That's it, period. I mean, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to equate that. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's also um, important for organizations, especially local organizations, to really kind of sew into their community and their locale. So for instance, I can't have an event <laughs> and think that I can lazily send out Facebook invites and then be mad when no one shows up to my event, okay? So this kind of lazy operating is, there's just no more room or time for it. I mean, and if you have time for it, then be comfortable with where you are because there's a lot of talent. There are young people. I mean, I, I go back to young people because they represent the future of wherever you're headed, okay? Um, there are middle schools, there are high school, even elementary schools. Um, like, I don't know how many organizations, some are great at this and some are terrible at it. Um, but I think it can be great to go into these schools and have FaceTime with these kids and give them, you know, like talk to them about <laughs> the reality of being in an orchestra, not just, I mean, it, it's great that you have like instrument petting zoos and these like children's concerts where kids go in like once a year and kind of have like an open cattle call for them to like, you know, have this experience. I think that's great. I'm not saying that's a bad thing, but it's kind of like this grassroots effort. I think we need to get back to um, where you are really connecting with people because children are people too. And they're going to eventually either decide that they're going to, you know, go into music schools and especially these schools that have 
um, orchestra programs um, or youth orchestra program, like DC Youth Orchestra program. Like, I don't recall ever, like, I, I mean, we had guest conductors, sure, but I don't ever recall having, like, sitting down and talking with someone who worked at an orchestra. I don't recall mm. any of that. Um, mm. I, I Certainly, it would have shaped my um, perception in high school when I was certainly at a pre-college level um, and considering whether or not I was going to go you know, go into school with, with the notion that I want to prepare myself for being in an orchestra. Um, so I think maybe that's something to consider. Again, I, I think that there are some organizations that are doing that, but I think too few are. Hmm. So I'm going to um, just take a second here and read um, a little bit of what Stephanie and Jessica wrote about um, descriptions of orchestra. So again, we're not, and we may not, uh, hopefully I think we may be able to make this available to people afterwards, which I think could be really interesting. Um, let me also just give a shout out to my colleagues, uh, Weston Sprott and Shay Scruggs, right? Who were some of the first people to start talking, that I heard, talking about the uh, inadequacy of orchestra position job descriptions and how we're really missing an opportunity to sell our organizations and tell our story? And how is it that two positions that have $100,000 difference in salary are in wildly different cities and in wildly different parts of the country will describe their position the same way? Two words, right? The, the, the instrument and the title. So section viola, principal clarinet. How is it, right, from the Met to you know a, a much smaller institution that those two things would be the same and again to credit weston and shay they talk about how by being more creative and thoughtful about those job descriptions actually you can use each hire as sort of a mini strategic planning session so credit to them for putting this in our minds and helping shape our conversation and i think it's something to think about so um, Jessica wrote, um, and then maybe afterwards you can just tell me why you made some of the choices, but I think our audience will start to hear some themes in the description of the organizations that you're talking about. Jessica described the organization, um, why we care and how we operate. So this is her orchestra that she would want to work for. Core values of our orchestra include a commitment to active, diverse, and current programming, an openness to creative evolution and growth. Our musicians are respected for who they are, their respective talents, and their commitment to the community in which we exist. We believe in active commitment to the, uh, sorry, we believe in active community and board musician engagement and ask this of each musician on stage. We see our organization as both a company and a service, and we treat our musicians and patrons with the same consideration. As a symphony musician, you would demonstrate a commitment to art artistic excellence, an openness to change and adjustment, and a commitment to effective action, exciting community engagement. You will have a say in programming choices and an open invite to board meetings. You will find excitement in engaging in new methods of arts education. Have the option to engage in mentor-mentee relationships with a diverse group of students and young professionals. And from Stephanie, we got Los Angeles-based orchestra seeks classically trained musicians from various backgrounds, ethnic and cultural backgrounds. LGBTQ, LGBTQ plus musicians are encouraged to apply. Individuals with strong connections to the Latino and or African American community and are actively working towards empowering those communities are strongly encouraged to apply. So these were job descriptions or the beginnings or, or company descriptions of companies that you would want to work for. Is there any, so there are some themes in all of those that I think are similar. Is there any, um, anything you want to, I'm, I'm mindful of the time and we have to leave time for James to come in at the end and, and take us home. But um, yeah, Stephanie, please speak to, speak to any and all of them. Sure. The reason why I specified Los Angeles based is because, I mean, we were talking about where would we want to be? Where do we see yeah. ourselves? Yeah. So that was my specification. I also included um, individuals with connections to the Latino and our African American community because Los Angeles is in Southern California. And so right. what, whatever that community looks like, um, if it's a Bangladeshi community, then it would include that. You understand what I mean? So mm -hmm. that's why that was included in that description. Mm -hmm. um, I think the outreach component is hugely important. And this is a conversation that has crept up in so many conversations with my friends and colleagues. 
it is so offensive <laughs> to be invited to be part of an educational outreach or any sort of out, outreach engagement capacity and not be good enough to be in the orchestra. Mm. That's tokenism at its finest. It is mm. incredibly offensive. Mm. Um, so that's something that I want to say on record. If mm. your outreach hires don't represent <laughs> what your orchestra looks like, that's something mm. to consider. Mm. Fascinating. Tia, Jessica, any, anything to, to draw out there or, or yeah. Please. Yeah, um, <clears throat> I don't know if we'll have time to read the, the testimonial that I wrote because that's the answer to the later question. We will, we will. But that kind of gives context to why yep. I wrote my job description because I actually started at the testimonial because okay. it's easier for me to think of terms as far as like what I didn't get and what I wish would be in place. Yeah, mm -hmm. that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Absolutely, Tia. Okay. Anything? So I'll wait then. Yeah, sure. We'll we'll do that right. We'll do that right after this. Cool. No, I mean I don't think I have anything else to add. Just, just going to co-sign, right? I, I love it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay, so let's do this. Let's um let's turn to that activity that we engaged in, right? That answering the question. I knew I was in the right place when. And are are, are do you three have that up? Are you able to read that? If we if if okay, so let's start. Jessica, you just brought that up. So yeah, share with us this, what the right place looks and sounds like. Okay. Um, so I knew I was in the right place when I was offered the option to make a higher salary that was based on community and academic engagement. In my pre-trial plus audition in-person interview, the orchestra laid out clear and realistic plans to both engage the community and continuously seek musicians that can relate to its patrons and students in both an artistic and socioeconomic way, including, amongst other things, a system of accountability between the members of the board and the musicians themselves for both artist care and community engagement. I'd read about this in the job description, but I didn't believe it was true until I took my trial. At that point in the interview, even though I hadn't yet taken my audition or trial, I felt that my perspective was valued as a member of the organization versus the normal feeling of being one in a sea of all others, all subject to a traditional hierarchy that seemed to outweigh the actual priorities of its employees on and off the stage. During my interview, benefits were outlined and it was made clear the level of engagement necessary outside of the concert hall, whether it be through the use of social media or other extraneous elements. This was followed by a discussion about previous orchestral experience and I didn't feel pressured to feel some kind of summer quota experience that was isolated to paper. I felt that my interviewee and the orchestra committee by proxy had a human interest in how I came to find myself applying for a spot in their ensemble. The interview was conversational without losing the formality of process. Finally, I was given the choice to know, <clears throat> job descriptions only, no names, who would be on my audition panel. Even though the audition was later that afternoon, it helped to soothe my anxiety to feel like I had a plan. Remembering that the orchestra had a pre-existing structure for accountability with regards to musician treatment and arts education, one that included things like open board meetings that took place in the hall instead of a closed room, and an internship program that actively paired administrative and educational interns with symphony musicians outside of the office also had a calming effect. This seemed even more appealing to me after learning that the orchestra offered internships for both school credit and for pay. They were currently piloting a program that called for interns involved in both the performance and administrative worlds of the orchestra. At the conclusion of the interview, I was compensated for any travel expenses and told that I were to pass the, that if I were to pass the screen audition round, any further travel and accommodations would be covered by the orchestra. Throughout my application and audition process, I felt valued and respected. My experience is factored into the application process, and this alone was unprecedented for an orchestra. So you knew you were in the right place when. That's fantastic. Um, Stephanie, yeah, I really Tia, enjoyed I'll... the prompt. Yeah, please. <laughs> oh, good. It's a good. great prompt. I'm glad. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's yes. incredible to hear, to be honest. Um, <laughs> I would love, 
who have walked away from an experience like that. Um, right. Yeah, it's overwhelmingly should, positive and should not be a fantasy. <laughs> yeah, and supportive and supportive. Yeah. Um, but that requires an organization putting mm-hmm. its money where its mouth is, you know. Um, so I knew I was in the right place. But let me let me start by saying I am not like a full time member of a traditional orchestra. I work within scoring orchestras, so um, I'm frequently sitting alongside people who are members of um, LA Phil, LA Opera, LA Chamber Orchestra. Okay, so um, I knew I was in the right place when I truly felt visible, (laughs) appreciated, and valued. Um, I think after so many years in school and in the workplace, um, in, in the traditional classical workplace, I had felt devalued and in worst cases, invisible. Um, And I truly knew I had found my place when I stopped being anxious about what people thought about me, thought about my playing, (laughs) and was able to fully commit to the creative process without being burdened with the weight of bias and prejudice. Um, I say that because, you know, I worked for the Sphinx organization um, over a number of years. And I mean, they've I think they've they've touched many of many of us and many of our colleagues in I mean in an immensely positive way, and um, I I truly support their mission and their vision and what they continue to do in the space. Um, but outside of that, there was no full time creative position. You know what I mean? There's not an orchestra that I could be hired for and salaried by. You know through that you know, that entity. And so, um, like I I started my company back in 2012 after I left the University of Trinidad and Tobago. Um, And I just, honestly, I wanted to work on my own terms. Um, I just felt like I was tired of uh, the emotional roller coaster, (laughs) the emotional labor um, of, I I just felt so anxious every time I entered the space. Um, And, you know, so anyways, I I, um, started kind of having little um, spot placements here and there while I was uh, teaching and doing other things, including my my time in Trinidad. And so um, I figured I could start my own company, try my hand at it and, Honestly, you know, I just wanted to try my hand and if things went to crap, I could always move back home and start over because there was no disappointment that could top not trying at that point because I had Mm. hit, I mean, I think it just hit a fever pitch in terms of my level of frustration. Mm -hmm. Um, And then fast forward to today, you know, I can't tell you like how many mind, mind blowing moments that I have. Um, and you know, every experience is really unique and I'm so grateful to all of the artists, all the musicians, including Tia, including Jess, including you, Alex, and, um, Mm -hmm. like all of my artistic colleagues that I've met along the way that I, you know, connect to and have dialogue with, but I mean, it's incredible to, to be and to connect and have like direct communication, either via call or meeting or email with people like Jimmy Iovine, Hans Zimmer, No ID, Ernest Wilson, you know, um, and various artists, music directors who actually value my musical talent, value my creative input, value my feedback and perspective. That's mm. when I knew I was in the right place. Mm. Mm. Tia, how how did you finish that sentence? I knew I was in the right place when. I have a much shorter answer. (laughs) I I, I took this as just um, more uh, literally situational. So Mm -hmm. for me, it was kind of a two-part answer in terms of I knew I was in the right place in my career when I was in a place where I could give back, when, where I could create opportunity. And then currently, for me being in Jagged Little Pill, there was a very just, I remember how I felt in this moment and in this exact situation. When I first walked into what would be considered our first rehearsal, it was going to be a rehearsal for this cast album recording that we were going to be recording all weekend. 
I walked into this room at Electric Lady Studio, and it wasn't just the band. It was uh, all, the, all the producers and a lot of people that were involved. And I looked around the room and I saw how diverse it was and all of these different creatives in this room. And the first thing that we did was we went around the room, we said who we were, what we did, and our pronouns. Mm. And I knew I was in the right place. I knew mm. that this space was here to create a space for me, that I would mm. be feel safe. Mm. So that mm. was it just, I just will never forget that feeling of just, I had, that was literally the first time I had ever been in any workspace, work, quote unquote mm. workspace, you know, it's so hard mm. to call it when our passion is our art, but I had ever been in a space where they said, we're going to introduce ourselves and what do you do and what's your pronoun? Mm. And if, and then when you come see our, come see Jagged Little Pill, you'll see it's our, the pronouns are printed in the program. Mm. So it's, it's mm. very important. Yeah. That's, I, that's unique. And in that it doesn't happen in classical music in the ways that you think it would. It doesn't happen in this scope. I've seen it in the classical world in New York with like wordless music ensemble, existential orchestra, um, we, when Urban Playground Chamber Orchestra, when we, we use non-gender specific dress codes, um, I use non-gender specific dress codes. It's part of the reason why I use style boards when I contract. Um, mm. You don't see that in the places where the salaries are. That's the problem. Mm. It shouldn't be so revolutionary. Mm. And I really, mm. um, yeah, I really feel that on a deep level. Because it's true. I mean, like, the, the, and, and just very quickly, that extends to the festival space. That extends to spaces that exist for black people. You know, I don't know that there's a, there's a trans presence at some of the black festivals. I don't, I haven't seen it. Um, mm. The question is never asked of us there. You know, there are things that, that expand beyond just this narrative that we mm. don't see in classical music as a whole. And I think that that's limiting the amount of fiscal progress that these mm -hmm. orchestras can actually make right now. Like it requires mm -hmm. almost nothing. You don't have to download software. You just have to get current. It's like really the only thing. Um, so we have a little bit of time left. I'm gonna to try to do a quick, well, so first off, I just wanna express my own personal thanks and I feel very confident I'm speaking for all of our audience members out there. Just how <laughs> grateful I am to you and your time and your candor and your story and your willingness to share it. It's been a great couple weeks for me getting to hang out with you way more than the rest <laughs> of these people have. But I think uh, the, the crowd out there uh, can understand why I've enjoyed it so much and they've enjoyed it too. I want to just do a quick round robin through some questions just to be responsive to them because I'm sure they feel like they only have this moment with you and they want to get them all in. Um, so I'm just going to, if we can just keep our answers as crisp as possible. Um, and I, but I just want to honor the, everyone's uh, participation. So um, there was one question regarding, uh, uh, there are questions, uh, Lady Jess, regarding your job description. I want to clarify that that is not a job that, or a process that Jessica experienced in the real world. But were she to experience it, she would know she was in the right place. And again, that goes back to our framing, right? Orchestras are not going to be the better in the future when they have more diversity. They're poorer right now for their lack of diversity. And so we imagined what those organizations would look like. Um, so uh, there's also some questions about, um, could, uh, would you be willing to share those statements? And I think, uh, is the, I think the answer to that largely, yeah, for at least sure. from some of us will be yes, great. So I also <clears> wanna <throat> say hi Absolutely. to Catherine Arledge. Nice to know that you're online, I haven't seen you in a while. So thanks for putting that question in. As a friend of mine who works overseas. Um, there's also a question from our good friend, Jen Arnold who wants to know, hey Jen, um, yeah, hey Jen. Uh, she, says, uh, <laughs> she says a few things, but at the end she says, let's pretend American orchestras have an inclusive work culture, so not a workforce, but an inclusive work culture and fair auditions. If in that context, an orchestra personally reached out to you to have, an, to have you audition, would you be more likely to attend that audition? So you could answer for yourself but also just as a broad thing do you think that would be helpful for orchestras as a practice to start engaging in um possibly i can't say definitively yes um because 
there have to be a range of things that I would see from said, you know, mythical organization Mm -hmm. um, that would lead me to believe that they were truly interested in Mm -hmm. progress. I think Mm -hmm. the classical music sector has historically been behind the trend. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, we're not living in the Beethoven era era where it's like mainstream Mm -hmm. the way that it really can and should be. Mm-hmm. Um, so I think I would, I would have to see that. And so then, saying, if, please go ahead. No, 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 no. Ask, ask your question. I'm saying, so you what you're saying, just to keep us, uh, you're saying you would probe for yourself, whether or not they truly had an inclusive work culture. So before you would, if they gave Correct. you a call, you would then have some questions for them and you would want to know like, is this real? Or are you just following a script and trying to get me to come to your audition? Correct, that, that, because yeah. I think that oftentimes organizations say, you know, things and they, they build in these wonderful catchphrases that I'm sure land them great grants. Um, but yeah. the actuality of um, implement, putting their money where their mouth is and, mm-hmm. and um, having receipts for the work that they are mm. actually currently doing to mm. uh, support said statements Mm. i have to see that and one we have a two-parter from daniel i'm going to do the second part not the first but i'm going to ask tia to respond because it's right in her wheelhouse the question is this how can artistic administrators promote diverse artists and provide a platform for opportunity while avoiding tokenism while avoiding avoiding tokenism I, I, so how, I think it's yeah. I, I think it's 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 trying to say that it, it, it's such a it's like a baited question because mm. it's 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 trying to say that having diversity in the space and um, and creating opportunity is is like a commodity or so, mm-hmm. which it's not this this is representative mm. of of culture of of where we are okay. right now like it's it's not this is not exactly. a trend. This is not a trend. Right. Hiring exactly. and diversifying your space is not a trend. It's not a token. It's not. This mm. is something that it like that should have been going on for years, and that mm. I think I'm not going to speak for everybody on this panel, but like led to so much of my frustration that I said I have to finally do something about this. Yeah, I'm not going to mm. sit around and, and wait for somebody else. And now, now if you want to see what my organization is doing and now get on board, let's do this. Mm-hmm. 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 Mm. All right. 100%. Fascinating. So for, first off, let me just extend uh, personal thanks uh, to my friends and colleagues. Um, it's just been a pleasure working with you, developing this. Um, let me also extend my thanks to the Mellon Foundation, who uh, uh, provides the funding for this track at the conference. And also, it's important to note that the Mellon Foundation, along with Sphinx and the League and New World, is behind the National Alliance for Audition Support which is doing good work in this space around trying to close some of the gaps that we've talked about as it relates to getting to auditions, knowing about auditions, broadening these networks. I invite orchestras that have not heard about this to start doing some investigation into this. Reach out to all three of those organizations, New World, uh, The League, uh, Sphinx, and actually four, obviously Mellon as well, to find out how you can engage and how you can support and how these programs could maybe benefit your orchestra and the work that you may or may not be trying to do. Um, and um, yeah, just, a, just I'm so grateful. It's been such a pleasure. Uh, I think er- out there in the world, everyone is joining me and giving you a huge hand. And uh, James, if you're with us, I'll toss to you to, uh, to bring us out. So thank you so much for your time. And um, yeah, it's just been, just been hugely inspirational. Thanks so much. Great. Just to echo what you are here sometimes, Alex. Thank you so much, Jess, Stephanie, and Tia and to you, Alex, for leading this really important, honest, inspirational conversation. It's been really fantastic today. And that wraps up today's session. So (laughs) thanks to each of you in the audience for joining us. And I just have a few quick reminders. Uh, Please take a minute to complete the survey I mentioned at the top of the hour. The link's in the session description below. Um, If you were able to make a donation to our Stronger Together campaign, we'd be so grateful. Thank you for that. Uh, Just again, click the Stronger Together button in the Feed Loop navigation, though I understand that Feed Loop is down right now. So please visit our website. 
Um, and again, thank you, Alex, for mentioning the Mellon Foundation. Thank you again for sponsoring this session and the equity, diversity, and inclusion uh, work we're doing at the online conference. And also, for those of you in the audience, please take a minute to join, uh, to check out your constituency meetings and the schedule in Fee Loop. We're regularly adding new sessions, and we don't want you to miss out on anything. And also, please take a drop by our exhibit hall, which is also in the navigation panel in Feed Loop. And we look forward to seeing some of you again tomorrow at 1 p.m. Eastern for our next session, Building Scenarios for an Uncertain Future. Thanks again to you, Jess, Stephanie, and Tia, and Alex. And uh, have a great day, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Thank you.